This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, an associate professor of preventive medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. This is Southern Remedy Kids and Teens on MPB Think Radio. I'm Dr. Morgan McLeod, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and Internal Medicine at UMMC. Today we are going to be talking about diabetes. It is a very common medical problem and we are seeing it more in our kids as well. And so today that's what we're going to be talking about um, kind of going over the differences between type 1 and type 2 and how we diagnose it and how we treat it and then as always I'll be here to answer any questions that you may have so please give us a call this morning and share your comments and questions or you can always send us an email as well to kids at mpbonline.org. Um, So I feel like diabetes is always a hot topic, and we haven't talked about it in a while. Uh, So I thought it would be a good time to to bring it up. Um, We do see diabetes a lot. We also see a lot of prediabetes. And so I wanted to talk about that um, and encourage you to go get screened because there's a lot of people that are prediabetic and they don't realize it. Um, And so this just stresses the importance of making sure you're getting at least yearly checkups uh, so that we can keep an eye on this and know for sure. Because a lot of times, just like blood pressure, you don't really know you have high sugars. You don't know you have diabetes, just like you don't realize you have high blood pressure. And part of the problem and part of the reason that is, is because our bodies are very smart. They are very good at adjusting. So you'll, you know, are, they do such a good job at kind of like recalibrating, I guess is like the best term to describe it, uh, to those higher sugars and to those higher blood pressures, so much so that you don't even really recognize the signs of that anymore. Um, and so that's why I say it's important to make sure you're getting your screenings because there's a lot of people out there that are suffering with higher sugars and they don't realize it. Um, so pre-diabetes, what do I mean when I talk about pre-diabetes? Because that's one of the topics I wanted to make sure we discussed. Because I feel like we've been, I've seen some commercials lately for it. Um, and I was in my doctor's office not too long ago. And they have like a TV in there where they run the little ads and songs and things like that. And they, they talked about pre-diabetes in, in their um one of their little TV commercials that they do. So you're starting to hear about it more and more and see more about it. So I just wanted to make sure that we address that. So prediabetes is a sign that your body is starting to have problems processing the glucose. Um, So, or the term that we use is glucose intolerance. So we have glucose, which is the main sugar in our body. And that is what our bodies and the cells in our bodies use for energy. And so what happens is all that sugar is in our body whenever we break it down with what we're eating. And our pancreas secretes insulin, which helps us take up that glucose into our cells so that our cells can use that for energy. You know, type 1 diabetics don't have insulin. Type 2 diabetics and pre-diabetics still have insulin. Their pancreas still makes insulin. However, they just don't utilize that insulin very well. So even though their body still has insulin, it's not working very good at helping those cells take in that glucose. And then when that happens, the glucose floats around in your blood. And when you have higher levels of glucose in your body than you should, then over time, vessels get damaged. And that's when you see the problems. Um, So that's why a lot of times people that have diabetes have problems with their heart because the glucose can affect having high glucose can affect your heart, the vessels to your heart. Um, Strokes, because the same thing, just like it affects the vessels to your heart, it affects the vessels to your brain. Kidneys, same thing eyes. Um, And you hear a lot of people with uh, diabetes talk about neuropathy or that like burning pain and um, nerve pain that they get in their hands and feet. Well, that's because the sugar damages the nerves, just like it damages the vessels. 
So pre-diabetes is the first sign that your body is starting to have trouble utilizing that insulin and glucose. So the way that we do that is we do a screening blood test. And you can do just a random glucose. And some insurances, that's what they actually prefer. So it depends on what your insurance plan is and what what will be covered. Majority of people, the insurance, though, will cover an A1C. Um, and personally, I prefer the A1C because the A1C is called, it's the hemoglobin A1C. And so essentially, the, the hemoglobin is the protein molecule that's in your red blood cell. Um, and so what we're measuring is, it is the, essentially, it's looking at how your sugar has been controlled over about a two to three month time period based off of, you know, how much sugar is on that hemoglobin, I guess is kind of a way to think of it. But long story short, you don't have to be fasting for it, which is nice because a lot of people don't like to come to the doctor fasting. Um, It measures over a two to three month time period. So you can't just, you know, know you have a doctor's appointment coming up next week and try to start eating a little bit better and watching what you eat, exercising a few days before you go to your doctor, because it's not going to make that much of a difference. So it's the best to me, it's the best. Um, but you can can diagnose impaired glucose tolerance based off of a, a regular screening glucose too. But majority of insurances are going to cover the A1C, thankfully. Um, and you can do that test. It's covered pretty much by every wellness screening um, along with the cholesterol panel. So just make sure when you go to the doctor that you ask to get your A1C screen so you can see where you fall. So when we look at that A1C, there is a couple of different ranges we're looking at. Anything above 6.5 is what we consider diabetes. Um, And so if you're a diabetic out there, I know you are very familiar with the term A1C because hopefully your doctor has talked to you about what your goal would be for your A1C. And that can depend on different things, especially as you get older. Um, We're a little more lenient with our A1C goal. So hopefully you've had that conversation with your doctor. Um, If you are not diabetic, then you may have never heard of this. So that's why I wanted to make sure we brought it up. But pre-diabetes, so diabetes, like I said, is anything above 6.5. Pre-diabetes falls in that range 5.7 to 6.5. And you don't really need to memorize those numbers or anything like that. It's just to show you that it's about a full point higher than what we, I mean, full point less than what we diagnosed diabetes at. And that just lets us know that you're starting to have some trouble um, controlling that glucose and controlling your sugar. And it's kind of like a wake up call. Uh, That's kind of what I think of it as, you know, um, when you hear that, then you know, we know that means you have a higher risk of developing diabetes if you don't change your lifestyle. Um, and it just kind of helps the patient see where they're at. You know, nobody likes to be told they have any medical problems. Um, and a lot of times it will make you realize, oh, okay, maybe I really should take better care of myself. So, I, you know, everybody should be screened for prediabetes. Majority of the time, like I said, you don't have to do anything. Um, There are some arguments out there that you could go in and start some medications for it, Um, especially with these newer, the GLP-1 class of medicines that you probably see all over the place, like Ozempic and Manjaro and Trulicity. Um, These are diabetes medications that are also really good for weight loss, too. We know that there is a direct link with your increased risk of obesity and type 2 diabetes. So a lot of people are pushing to kind of go on and start some of these medicines a little bit early for prediabetes. Um, unfortunately, insurance hasn't picked up on that yet, <laughs> and so they're still really expensive. Um, metformin is another medicine you may hear people tell you about if they get diagnosed with prediabetes. So, And we're going to talk some more about the medicines. Um, but metformin is kind of our first standard medicine that we do for diabetes. And so we do use that a fair amount in patients with prediabetes. Um, so who would we give medicine to if you're pre-diabetic? I guess that's another question people have because um, when I tell people they fall in that pre-diabetes range and I kind of explain that they're at increased risk for ha- developing diabetes, we know that their body's having trouble processing the sugar, and it's really important to start being very mindful about what we eat. Um, they ask me, well, do I have to start a medicine? Um, and so who would I tell to start a medicine? Um, 
It would be somebody who is a little bit higher on the A1C, closer to the type 2 diabetes, uh, you know, like as you're inching closer to that 6.5. If you're fairly young, then a lot of times I will, uh, just because it helps kind of jumpstart that. Uh, Metformin helps you lose a little bit of weight for most people, and definitely those GLP-1s help you lose weight. So a lot of that can help you kind of jumpstart your journey um, with changing your lifestyle with your diet in particular and weight loss. So um, if you're younger, if you're a little bit higher on that A1C, um, if you have other risk factors, so if you have high blood pressure or you have high cholesterol, and then definitely if you've ever had a heart attack or stroke, they're probably going to be a little more prone to pushing you for medicines. Um, but majority of people for the prediabetes, um, it's more of just a wake-up call so we can know that we need to start changing our lifestyle. And Last thing I'm going to say about prediabetes before we take our break and then we can get into the nitty gritty about actual diabetes is the reason I think it's so important to make sure that you know um, and that you're getting screening for prediabetes is because one of one out of three people have prediabetes. So that when you look at it that way, um, it's a pretty staggering number. So it's me, Lacey and. I'm not sure who our call screener is today. The wonderful Liz Gill. Hey, Liz. So of the three of us, potentially, one of us could have or could soon be developing prediabetes. And so that's really scary And that 90% of people don't realize that they have it. Um, So wanted to make sure we talked about prediabetes because I feel like they're putting that out there more. And I just kind of wanted to give a background about what that is before we started actually talking about diabetes. So quick recap before we get into diabetes if you're just tuning in so prediabetes one out of three people have prediabetes and don't realize that they have it 90 percent of people don't know that they have it prediabetes is can be diagnosed based off of an a1c which is a measure of how your sugar has been over the past two to three months time period and depending on where you fall in that range we can diagnose you with prediabetes which means you are showing signs that you're having trouble um, with your insulin and your glucose control and that means you have a higher risk of developing diabetes so it's a good wake-up call for a lot of people especially if you have high blood pressure or cholesterol problems, have had a heart attack, stroke, anything like that, then we're going to be a little bit more aggressive with treating it. But majority of people, um, as long as you change your lifestyle, you can actually manage a lot of it with just lifestyle changes before we actually have to, to start any medicines. Um, So let's talk a little bit about the different types of diabetes. So there's type 1 and there's type 2 diabetes. Type 1 is typically the one that we think about in younger patients. Um, And usually around, there's like kind of two peaks that we see about 4 to 6 years of age. And then we see it again in like 10 to 14 years of age. Um, And there is another kind of gray area of the type 1 diabetes that we actually see in like kind of early 20s, sometimes even trickling into the 30s, um, where they don't have the main type of type 1 diabetes, but their body is producing a different type of antibody that can that can lead to what looks like a type 1 diabetes. So there is, there is that gray area um, that you may have heard of. But essentially, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune process, and that means your body is attacking itself. And so what's happening is your body is creating antibodies that destroys the pancreas. And like I said, the pancreas is what makes your insulin, which is what makes your body be able to use the glucose. So if you don't have insulin, then your body can't use the glucose. That being said... All of our type 1 diabetics have to be on insulin. Um, That is just a given. Their body does not make insulin anymore. Um, And so, therefore, they're going to have to be on insulin. Why do some people get this? We don't really know. Um, You know, we don't know why a lot of people get autoimmune disease processes in general. You know, autoimmune disease processes include like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, um, different things like that, that where your body essentially attacks itself. We think that there's probably some predisposition, you have some kind of genetics, something that predisposes you to that, because we do see a lot of autoimmune processes that run in families. Um, we also know that if you have an auto, one autoimmune disease, you're going to be more prone to developing another one. So we see a lot of people who have type 1 diabetes end up with 
thyroid problems um, where they have a similar process, that they have antibodies that cause problems with their thyroid, celiac disease, and really any autoimmune process. Anybody uh, with type 1 diabetes is at risk for that. But we do. We know you probably have some kind of predisposition, and then we think there's usually some kind of insult. So a lot of times it follows some kind of random viral illness that you have that stimulates your body's immune system, and then it just kind of goes out of whack. Um, so unfortunately, type 1 diabetics are going to be on insulin because they don't have any insulin. And that's typically why we see it in our younger kids. Um, And whereas type 2 diabetes is the one that's not necessarily mean you're going to have to get on insulin. This is the one that's more associated as you get older. There's actually more of a, a family association with this. So this is the type of diabetes that tends to run more in families. So even if you're healthy, I have plenty of patients who really are not overweight they're very active um, but they have diabetes and granted it's not terrible diabetes but they do have to be on one or two medicines and a lot of them just have a really strong family history of it but typically the type 2 diabetics are the ones that um, we think about as you get older as you are overweight um, and can be associated with other medical problems too so Type 2 diabetes is a little different than type 1. Like I said, type 1 is when you completely destroy your pancreas and you have no insulin. Um, Type 2 diabetes, your pancreas is still making some insulin, uh, but it's not able to really utilize that insulin, and so therefore the sugar stays high. Eventually, if you stay a type 2 diabetic long enough, your pancreas kind of dies out and quits making the insulin. So you will see some type 2 diabetic patients that are on insulin therapy. Um, but with majority of people with type 2 diabetes, we can manage with a lot of other medicines before we have to get to insulin, thankfully. So one thing that I... Um, I got on the American Diabetes Association website uh, before the show just to see if there was any any new little tidbits in there because um, if you are a diabetic, that is a wonderful resource. Or pre-diabetes, the American Diabetes Association website is awesome. They have all kinds of information on there, um, statistics, uh, health issue, you know, anything health and wellness. There's like nutrition plans. Um, They do a great job at talking you through like what to look for in your diet with carbohydrates and carb counting. They even have recipes on there. There's all kinds of stuff on there. But anyway, one thing that I found in there, and um, I would, you know, love to hear anybody's thoughts on this because I honestly had not truly thought of this, um, but it's, it kind of, was similar to a conversation I actually had with a family earlier this week. Um, So they were talking about food insecurity um, and the risk of diabetes with food insecurity. We're seeing that happen a lot. Um, So the term food insecurity, if you're not familiar with that, that is um, how comfortable people feel with having food readily available to them. Um, And so we unfortunately have a problem with that in Mississippi, in the United States, too. Um, Some of our people that live here are unable to get all, have access to all the food that they need due to financial strains, due to location, whatever it may be. But for the majority of people, it's financial strain. Um, And so what they were talking about, which makes total sense because it's similar to the conversation, like I said, I had um, with some patients earlier this week. Good food, healthy food is expensive. Um, And so a lot of our patients who are suffering with food insecurity and our own food stamps or even not own food stamps just have to base it off of their income Um, and with groceries the way that they are now it's hard to buy healthy foods it's hard to buy fresh fruits and vegetables it's hard to buy um, fresh eggs and meats and all the different things and so the Bad foods are cheaper. And when you don't have a lot of money and when you have a lot of constraints on what you can spend at the grocery store because you still have, you know, a limited income and you got to pay your bills and you got to, you know, provide clothes for your children and diapers and formula or whatever it may be, um, you know, you've got to figure out what you can spend on groceries. And a lot of times you got to get the cheaper stuff and it's not the healthy stuff. It's a lot of the processed foods. Um, And so with that, unfortunately, we are seeing a link to food insecurity and diabetes. And I just thought that was so interesting um, 
because I ha- it makes total sense, but it's not something that I had ever really thought about. So, um, so I was reading about that article on the American Diabetes Association website, and I, I just thought that was interesting. And it's also a, a question of preparation. Like, even if you do have access to, let's say, let's say healthy food was cheap, that doesn't mean you have the time to well, prepare and, and get it done. Yeah, very true. Very true. It really is a privilege to eat healthy. Yeah. Yeah, it's very true. It is hard um, as um, here I am actually trying to be a little bit better about getting some of my baby weight finally off now that it's been a year and a half. Um, (laughs) Trying to plan ahead and eat healthy meals, like you said, is very hard, too. You have to think ahead if you're going to try to eat healthy. And if you're going to try to change your lifestyle, you really do have to plan ahead. Um, and I try to like hit the deals and buy in bulk too. Um, especially when it comes to like my meat, I love fresh market. They put their meat on sales on Tuesdays and I go stock up every about once a month and I just fill my freezer up, um, and pull it out here and there as I can. Uh, but yeah, it is, it's hard. It's expensive to eat healthy. It's time consuming to eat healthy. I will say once you get in a routine, cause I've been doing it about a month now, um, where I've been trying to meal plan and, and make sure I have healthy lunches and healthy suppers. Um, once you get going, it, it gets a little bit better. Um, but when you're first starting out, it can be really overwhelming. Um, when you're trying to think through of like, okay, what am I, you got to think ahead. You can't, you know, that's what I try to tell people too. Um, when you're trying to make those lifestyle changes, you have to think ahead because if you don't think ahead, like, with kids going to school and this activity, that activity, work pulling you this way, you've got this deadline. I mean, there are too many things that come into play. And when you get home, you just want what's easiest and you want what's fastest. Um, And so with that, you may end up with the not most healthy option. So Two weeks. They say power through the first two weeks. It gets easier. I will say that's probably true because we started this journey. My husband and I have been doing it together for about um, a month now. And it's, it's getting easier. Um, I will say it's still not fun, <laughs> but it is getting easier with regards to like planning ahead of, of what we're going to eat and what we're going to eat for lunch and supper and that kind of thing. But um, anyway, not trying to start a political debate or anything like that, but I just thought that was a very interesting article. Um we know, obviously, food insecurity is not a good thing for multiple reasons, um, but this is just another reason to to think about that. And we have a lot of different options, like UMC has some different programs um, where they can provide a food pantry and... Um, Oh, what's the place? I can't think of what it's called. I know there's a oh, shoestring, Operation Shoestring. I know they have a big thing here. Um But there's lots of different opportunities out there, but a lot of people don't know about it. So um, if this is something that you're passionate about and you have some information, give us a call and and share that with us. Um, We do have a caller on the line, so we'll go to McKinley. Good morning, McKinley. What's going on? Oh, it's not a whole lot going on. Uh, You were just talking about the diabetes, so I wanted to ask a question on that. Go ahead. Okay. Do A1C, is that how you determine diabetes, A1C? You can. You can diagnose it based off of just a random glucose, but the A1C is is the most definitive way. You're exactly right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So uh, the reason why I call, I know every time I go to my doctor, mine is like, uh, I I reckon you say 6'1 and stuff like that, 6'3. Mm-hmm. Is that good or bad? Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's really good. So anything, we diagnose diabetes at 6.5. So if you're okay. under that, then that means your diabetes is well controlled. For a majority of patients, um, an A1C less than 7 is going to show that your diabetes is well controlled. Now, as you get older, um, you know, once you hit like 70s, 80s, we get a little more lenient with it. And um, especially as you get to 80, we, we're probably going to say your A1C goal is it's probably going to be closer to eight. Um, but for majority of people, as long as your A1C is under seven, that's a good sign. So you're doing a good okay. job, McKinley. Yeah, my doc, he kind of looked at me pretty well there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm hitting that 70, so I'll be 69 on my birthday. I guess I'm doing pretty good. I think you're doing pretty good. Yes. Yeah, so Are I'm you taking any medicines, or do you do you manage it just with yeah, your I diet? Take, I take high blood medicine. But no diabetes medicines? Medicine. No, I don't take diabetes medicine. Good. That's good. Yeah. So you're the perfect example that, you know, if you really do t- be mindful of what you're eating, you can usually manage your sugars at home. So that's awesome to hear. 
Okay, well, I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you for your call. Thank y'all. And we will go next to Willie. Good morning, uh, yeah. Willie. What's going on? Uh, yes, I was just looking at the show, your show, and I was um, uh, diagnosed. Well, my doctor said I was uh, borderline diabetic, uh, diabetic, and I heard she said pre-diabetic. Is that basically the same thing, or is that what I have worse? Probably, worse yeah. Without knowing, you don't happen to know, did they tell you what your A1C was? Um. Uh, she gave me a list, uh, and I'm not for sure exactly right now. That's okay. Uh, I can go back to it and, and, and find out exactly. Yeah. But, well, uh, most... she, uh, what they did was <clears throat> she gave me a machine to test my blood, and I've been uh, testing it, and uh, it's below 100 before I eat, and when I eat, uh, 124, it doesn't go over 160. They said you know, to go 160, uh, up to 160 is pretty bad, but, you know, it's been below that. Yeah. Yeah, so you are probably fall into that pre-diabetes range then. Um, so that pre-diabetes range, if, if you go back and look at your A1C, it's anywhere between 5.7 and 6.4. And so that, okay. you know, that kind of like borderline diabetic, that's kind of the same thing. We know that you're right. getting closer. 6.5 is diabetes. Um, so the closer you get to that 6.5, then the closer you are to, unfortunately, developing diabetes. And so pre-diabetes is that term we use. So I I bet that's probably what she means um, when she said borderline diabetic. But, yeah, you're right. As long as the what we call fasting, so before you eat, sugar stays under 130. And the oh. the postprandial, which is like about two hours after you eat, stays under 160. Um, then you should be pretty good. Okay. Okay. That's what I was concerned about when I heard you talking about it. And then I heard the other guy talking about it. I was just concerned, you know, what is it? Yeah, take a look. I bet I bet she checked your A1C and I bet that's I bet that's what she's looking at. Okay, well I'm a, I'll check with her and um I'll give you a call again, I guess, if I'm listening to the show you you bring it up. All right. Well thanks so much, Willie. We appreciate it. Have a great day. All right, thank you. Right. Um we will go next to Chuck. Good morning, Chuck. Good morning. <clears throat> I uh have a family history of type 2 on my dad's side, and he was overweight, and I'm not, and I'm 69, and I have my own glucose monitor, and every two or three months, I will, uh, so I have a long history to go on. I'm usually around 100 to, to 110 on my glucose monitor. So I'm not sure that I actually have uh, any at 69, and, and I eat ex- exceedingly well. My, my questions are, at, the, at my age of 69, um, and I have not done the AC1, and, and if I understand it, it's based on a long history of taking these glucose tests, which I've done. And I think in a decade, I had one that was 150 or something. But uh, given that scenario, counsel me on metformin, if that is, I I recently on uh, public radio, the advantages of metformin up and over, including heart um, and and other, it, it seems to be, an economical and a multi-purpose. Um, so give me some counseling on um, across the board where I uh, can go from here. Yeah. Okay, so metformin is our kind of first-line medicine that we use for diabetes. Um, it's kind of in its own class of medicine, so it doesn't fall in with a lot of other medicines. It's just kind of its own little medicine. Essentially what it does is it helps decrease the production of glucose, and then it also helps your body utilize the l- insulin that it has left. Um, so that's it's an easy medicine. 
Um, you do usually have to take it twice a day. Um, it doesn't interact with a lot of medicines, thankfully. It does cause a lot of side effects, though. A lot of people get upset stomach and diarrhea and different GI side effects with it. If you take the medicine with food or if you ask your doctor to give you the extended release version of metformin, majority of the time we can kind of mitigate those GI symptoms with it. It's very cheap. Um, it is very readily available. Gosh, we have so many medicines right now that are in back order. But metformin is a tried and true one. You can find it pretty much anywhere. Um, it's on the four dollar list at Walgreens, you know, Walmart, um, GoodRx. It's super cheap medicine, um, and so that's why a lot of the times we start with metformin. Yeah, and it um, given my scenario and my history. I watched my dad in his last decade, um, although he carried 50 extra pounds and, and didn't, I'm the model of fitness. Um, he um, and other uncles in the, in the family, we, we have um, a small amount of, uh, so, so as a prevent, my question is, is this a good preventative uh, for my scenario? to seriously consider. And fortunately, I also have a cast iron stomach. So I'm, I'm not going <laughs> so, to have the, the, the gastric uh, formats. But, um, well, good. So, so I would say I would look at kind of what your A1C is. Um, you're 69, so you're kind of like right there at that borderline where I would be a little bit more aggressive because you're still pretty young and you sound yeah. fairly healthy. So um, I would say we would lean. And a how do I get? Excuse me. How do I get the AC1? I, I've been glucose monitoring for two decades. Your um, your but, doctor can order it. Um, so as part of your wellness screening, so if you go to your wellness screening every year, um, the A1C is pretty much covered by every insurance. Um, and so that's the best way to do it is just go for your regular wellness screening, um, and they should be able to get it for you. Actually, most insurances won't fully cover your wellness visit until you get those labs drawn, too. Um, we've had several patients that, like, we didn't think they needed a A1C. When I first started medicine and I was trying to figure out, you know, the, all the rules and regulations, um, there were a couple of patients that I didn't check an A1C in because their sugars had been fine. And actually, Blue Cross wouldn't pay for their wellness visit because you have to have that lab checked within a six-month time period. Um, so all of that being said is you should be able to get that with your wellness visit. That would be the best way to do it. And then if you fall in that prediabetes range, just with your hist with your strong family history um, and the fact that you are, you know, monitoring your diet and you are exercising and you're already doing all the lifestyle things and you're still within that prediabetes range, eh, you may not be a bad candidate for the metformin. Yeah, good. This is quite informative because um, I am so disgustingly healthy. The healthcare system would go bankrupt because I never get anything. <laughs> um, so I, my wellness this is this is good because the really I don't want to take it for granted, but I, I don't know uh, my AC. Um, but those numbers, and I also need to also start monitoring more my blood pressure numbers and, um, you know, the whole range of, of shots that you, you kind of more need at this age. Yeah. Uh, Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, I would make sure you're getting your wellness visits. They can check your A1C. They can check your blood pressure. And like I said, if you if you fall in that prediabetes range and you're already doing all the things and with your family history, um, that would probably be a discussion to have with your doctor is getting on the metformin. Yeah. Can I can I make an appointment with you? <laughs> you, pretty much, you pretty much nailed everything. No, I, I appreciate um I listen to you guys quite often, so uh, it, um, uh, you give good information. Oh. So uh, I thank you. I thank you for all. 
Yes. Well, thank you for your kind words and thank you for listening. We appreciate it. Um, So we have talked a lot about uh, prediabetes and a little bit about the different types of diabetes, type 1 versus type 2. And like I mentioned, type 2 is the one that is uh, most of the time associated with our lifestyle. And that's kind of why I wanted to focus on that one a little bit more. Um, and if you have prediabetes, you're going to be at higher risk for developing diabetes. And so if you have a strong family history, you need to make sure you're taking that seriously and, and starting to change some of your lifestyle, uh, with your, with your diet and getting out and exercising. So a few other things that make you a little more prone to developing diabetes, not only family history, that's very important. Um, your age. So the older you get, that's another one of those things, just add it to the list that aging makes you at higher risk for. Um, but anybody over 45, uh, being overweight is another one. Um, and, uh, African Americans, Latinos, uh, for some reason that population tends to be a little bit higher risk for that as well, developing diabetes. And then lastly for women, if you've ever been diagnosed with gestational diabetes, so gestational diabetes is a little different. That's the diabetes that you develop while you're pregnant. Um, and that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with, um, you know, your weight situation. Um, There's plenty of people who are not overweight and have gestational diabetes um, and do end up, unfortunately, having problems with their sugar throughout pregnancy. And then that predisposes you to having diabetes um, after your pregnancy too. So those are going to be the bigger risk factors for it. Uh, We've got some callers. So let's go to Jane. Hey, Jane, what's going on? Um, I found this article that has just fascinated me, um, and I, uh, I I learned a lot from it. Just, but I just read it yesterday, and I wondered if you could comment on it, or if you haven't seen it, maybe you'd like to. Um, it's from AARP, and it, it's um, uh, doctors discovering how microbes in your gut help fight disease, and there, there are apparently even some new. Um, the very physicians who specialize in gut health, <laughs> the gastroenterologists. Um, so anyhow, that's, I hope that that contributes something. And um, like I said, if you haven't read it, it's worth looking up, okay? <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, there is a lot more research on that right now, the microbiome in your gut. That's the term. Um, the microbiome is the term that we use for that. Uh, you know, you've got a lot of good bacteria in your gut that helps you, and that's why a lot of people get on probiotics these days because um, there's so many things that dysregulate the normal bacteria that we have, and that can cause a lot of problems. Um, and we are finding that there is a link um, a lot more things than we probably initially thought of to that microbiome and the disruption that we have. Um, I don't, there's not a ton of definitive data out there yet about it, but there is a lot of developing research about it, and there's lots more links um, that are showing that there probably is some relation to that microbiome. And that's why it's so important, I talked about this in here multiple times, um, to not get on antibiotics if you don't need them. Um, that is one of the biggest ris- disruptors that we see. You know, people get on antibiotics all the time for little coughs and colds that, you know, are most likely viral and don't need an antibiotic. Um, that really disrupts the microbiome um, in our our gut. Um, there's lots of other things that do it, but I think our antibiotic overuse is is one of the bigger factors that we're seeing that disrupts that microbiome that we have naturally. So, yeah, I'll see if I can take good, a look. Good for all of us then. Yeah, <laughs> to have this information and find about find out about it. That's all I'm trying to do is share. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I will definitely and I look ain't into no it. Doctor. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for calling. Um, we'll go next to Vincy. Hey, Vincy. Hello. How you doing? Good. What's going on this morning? Uh, not much. I, I was just listening at you uh, talking about diabetes this morning. I'm a borderline diabetic. I'm 66 years old, and I'm also a truck driver. And uh, I'm on blood pressure medicine and metformin, but I usually uh, monitor my blood pressure and glucose. It usually run anywhere from 90 to 130. Um and my blood pressure used to run around 120-something to 140-something over 90. And uh, I tried to eat healthy, but, you know, on the road, it's kind of hard to kind of eat healthy. Oh, yeah, I, I do take metformin, but uh, 
I do vegetables like on the weekend, peas and beans and greens, you know, and I usually bring them on my truck with me. I, I have a refrigerator, and uh, I have an air fryer that I usually do like chicken and pork chops in, you know, to try to do that. But, like, is it okay to, you know, like eat a sandwich or something, like maybe once a day, like for breakfast or something, have a sandwich with bread? I know bread is not good, uh, rice is not good, and they start your food, but... Would it hurt to, you know, like eat bread or something like maybe once a day? Yeah. So you brought up a great topic. So I have a lot of patients actually that are truck drivers and have are in a similar situation as you or not even necessarily a truck driver that are on the road a lot for their job and have to travel. And it, it does. It puts a lot of constraints on you. Like Lacey and I were talking earlier, when you're trying to eat healthy, you really have to plan ahead. Um, it's a lot easier when you're out on the road just to go pick up some fast food. So the fact that you're even mindful of it, kudos to you, Vincy, because a lot of people, it, it takes a lot of planning like I said. That being right. said, yes, it's a, it's totally fine. So like I, t- I tell all my patients, everything is okay in moderation. So, you know, right. it's okay to even have to eat out at a fast food restaurant once or twice a week. It's just let's make good choices and do it all in moderation. So eating, um, you know, when you're picking your sandwich, try to find uh, wheat or uh, like wheat bread or maybe a wheat wrap that you could find. There's a lot of low-carb options when it comes to, like, wraps. Um, And there's some that are not even just, like, wheat. They have, like, tomato basil, or I found one the other day that was, like, honey wheat, but it was still low-carb. So as long as you're making good choices with that, you know, not um, trying to find leaner meats for it, Uh, turkey, um, if you can. Ham is pork, and it has a lot of salt in it, so you do have to be careful with that. It's higher in sodium. Um, But like turkey or chicken breast, making those kind of sandwiches on wheat bread, totally fine. You can also add some veggies on there, and that gives you some extra little, you know, healthiness to it as well. Yeah, that's what I usually do. I usually get the wraps from Subway, the uh, Mm -hmm. roasted chicken, and I usually put spinach, tomato, and stuff like that on it. And uh, during the night, you know, after I run out of my other food, I usually uh, have a salad, a chef salad, and a... I do uh, canned tuna, you know, make me up some tuna, and I usually eat that at night. But uh, I had uh, seen my doctor, I guess, about last month, and she required that I, you know, see a, see an eye doctor. So I went yesterday to my eye doctor, and they examined my eyes and everything and pressure checked them and all. And uh, he said a vessel behind my eye was in great shape. I didn't need any glasses or anything like that. He said six, six my eyes was really, really great. So he said that's one way you can tell what other stuff that are going on in your body through that little vein in your eye, you know. So he said that was that was in real good shape. Yep. So, so I guess that's a good sign, too. That is a really good sign. And you actually brought up the last thing that I wanted to make sure we talked about is – Um, what to think about if you have diabetes, not just your sugar, which is obviously the most important, but some of the other things. And the eye exam is one of the most important things because you're right. They can look at the, you know, when your sugar is too high or your blood pressure is too high, the the walls of the blood vessels in your arteries get damaged um, and your eyes is one of those. And so they can actually look at the blood vessels. They can see if you've had damage from high blood pressure or high sugars over time. Um, And you can develop what we call retinopathy, um, which are some of the changes to the retina because of all the blood vessels that the damage from the diabetes and the blood pressure. So, yes, you brought up a great topic. Okay, thank you very much. I like listening to you all. I get a lot of advice from you. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, thank you so much for calling. We appreciate it. Um, so the eyes is one of the most important things. Um, you need to have that every year. Um, so what we tell people is if you get diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, you don't have to start your eye exams for another year or two. But if you get diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, the minute you get diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, you need to go in and get your eyes checked. And that's because your sugar has probably been high for a while, which means you've had a little bit of damage probably done to your eyes. Um, and so if somebody tells you you have diabetes, 
diabetes, you want to go on and get you an eye doctor. Um, I would recommend an ophthalmologist for that. Um, that's a little different than an optometrist. The optometrists are great, and they are wonderful at providing glasses and contacts and even detecting some of these things. Um, but majority of the time, if there needs to be any kind of intervention, and unfortunately some people that have bad diabetic retinopathy do have to have intervention done, the ophthalmologist is the one to do that. So it's always nice to be plugged in to the ophthalmologist. Um, so that's what, if when you get start getting your eye screens, I would recommend that you go in and get plugged in with one um, so that that way if, you know, hopefully you don't, but if you do have to have any kind of intervention, you're already at the right provider. Um, foot exams, that's the other thing. Um, so a lot of times you've always seen and you hear the horror stories of people with diabetes and they end up having to have their foot amputated or their toes amputated. And a lot of times it's because you get that neuropathy, that pain, but also with that pain in your feet, you also lose sensation. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to check your feet, make sure you still have your sensation intact. Because if you don't and you scrape your foot, you may not realize it. And that's when those little little bitty scrapes that just seem my or to anybody else, that's when they can get infected because you have diabetes, you don't feel it, and you're not taking good care of it because you don't know it's there, and then it becomes infected. Having diabetes makes you at risk for... Um, for more problems with infections too. So that just kind of compounds it. So you want to make sure you're getting your eyes checked, getting your feet checked. You want to make sure that you're getting routinely screened for cholesterol and for di um, high blood pressure. So that's why it's so important to make sure you don't miss your doctor's appointments so that they're checking your blood work routinely and checking your blood pressure because that's really important because that only compounds the complications of diabetes. Um, and then last thing for diabetics is you want to make sure you're getting your vaccines. Um, I think Chuck maybe had mentioned it earlier too about um, there are certain vaccinations that you need when you have diabetes. Uh, you need to get your yearly flu shot because, like I said, it does make you more prone for complications from infections if you have diabetes. Your body just can't fight them off as well. So you want to get your flu shot, and then you want to get your pneumonia shot. Everybody needs a pneumonia shot after 65, but if you are younger than 65 and you've been diagnosed with diabetes, you need to go on and get your pneumonia shot a little bit earlier. So those were just the last few things I wanted to make sure that we addressed. If you have been told you have diabetes, eyes, feet, get your shots, and then make sure they're checking your blood pressure and cholesterol. Thank you all for all your calls today. It's been a great show. I really appreciate you all chiming in. Thanks, Lacey, for being our producer and Liz for being our call screener. Uh, stay tuned for NPR's Here and Now coming up next on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.